right, we're good to go. Okay. We are recording. You can tell me, tell us when we can start. Yep, go ahead, you're good to go. Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for this panel, Black Leaders in Classical Music. Um, we're pleased you're attending and I'm very pleased to be, ho uh, to be moderating this panel. Um, my name is Dave Hall. I'm president of the board of uh, Clarion Concerts. Um, and also with me is Eugenia Zuckerman, who's the artistic director of uh, Clarion Concerts and our three panelists who I'll be introducing in a moment. But first, I'd like to just say a word or two about what's gonna be going on today. And I'm gonna start with a little personal experience. When I was in college, I became friends with a black woman who, um, when I said something inadvertently racist or I inadvert inadvertently said something racist, really took me to task and schooled me and sat me down and gave me some lessons. And here was my reaction as, as a white person. I, was, I, was, I didn't think it was true. Uh, I was depressed. Uh, I was really upset. And I told myself, I re really care about this person and she's really smart, so I don't get it, but I'm going to give myself two weeks and presume everything she has told me about racism in America is true. And if at the end of the two weeks I begin to see it, I'm gonna admit it to her. And in my own experience, just as a young college student, it took me two days before I started to see uh, much of what she told me in practice, in the people around me, in fellow students, in classrooms. Uh, so what I want to say about this conversation we're having today is it may be a very uncomfortable one for many of us in, our, in the audience and people listening, um, but it's the sort of conversations we as Americans need to have. Um, race has been with us since the founding of our country. It hasn't, racism has not gone away. And the only way it's going to end is if we have conversations about it and do the hard work that's involved. And as I said, it is uncomfortable, but once you get past the discomfort and you are empowered with knowledge, um, you might be really inspired to see what you can do to help be a part of the solution to this really, really terrible problem. So. Uh, what I'd like to do now is uh, introduce our three panelists. And after I've introduced all three with a little bit of a biographical material about each, we'll dive right in. So I am going to be reading it. And some of one of our panelists' bio has a lot of German in it. So I'm apologizing in advance for my pronunciation of the German. First, with us today, I'm so happy, is Nokatula Nguanyama. She gained international prominence winning the Primrose International Viola Competition at 16 years old. The following year, she won the Young Concert Artists International Auditions, which led to debuts at the Kennedy Center and the 92nd Street Y. A recipient of the prestigious Avery Fisher Career Grant, she has performed with orchestras and as a recitalist the world over. This fall, Nokatula collaborated with Daniel Bernard Remain on ASU Care Cultural Center's show, Tuning Up, in a multidisciplinary discussion around Black, Indigenous, and people of color issues and classical music. Her work, Finding the Dream, commissioned by John Clements and written in response to the murder of George Floyd and Martin Luther King's iconic I Have a Dream speech, receives its world premiere with her children, Sophia Nguanyama Long on piano, Edward Endo Long on vocals and guitar, and the Grammy Award-winning Phoenix Boys Choir on their Awakenings program. Primal Message for Percussion, Harp, and Strings, an homage to the Arecibo Message, also receives an orchestral world premiere with the Detroit Symphony on the Digital DSO series. Next, our second guest, conductor and activist Brandon Keith Brown, is heralded as a rising star in the conducting firmament. He won third prize winner from 405T, the 2012 Sir George Solti International Conductors Competition in Frankfurt am Main, and was the audience favorite there. This launched an international career leading premier orchestras, including the Konzerthaus Orchestra Berlin, the Rundfunk Symphony Orchestra Berlin, the Badische Skatskapelle, 
Staatskapelle Weimar, the Tokyo Philharmonic, and members of the Vienna Philharmonic at the Salzburg Festival. Brown is a passionate educator who has gained a wealth of experience as a university professor and youth orchestra leader. As an activist, he speaks and consults frequently on institutionalized racism in classical music and how classical music can leverage social change. He's been featured in all major German media and here in the US too. His writings on race are featured on the medium, Deutschland, Deutschlandfunk Kultur, Berlin Tagesspiegel, and Die Zeit. Brown currently consults with conservatories, companies, and orchestras on equity, inclusion, and belonging. And our third amazing guest is Garrett McQueen. He's a proud native of Memphis, Tennessee, and has performed in venues across the country, including Los Angeles Disney Hall, uh, Detroit's Max M. Fisher Music Center, and New York's Carnegie Hall. And now is gonna follow an amazing list of the orchestras he's performed with. Mm -hmm. South Arkansas Symphony, Jackson Symphony, American Youth Symphony, Memphis Repertory Orchestra, the Eroica Ensemble, and most recently, the Knoxville Symphony Orchestra. He's worked with groups including the Sphinx Symphony Orchestra, Memphis Symphony Orchestra, the Southeast Symphony, the Artisphere and Gateways Festival Orchestras, the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra, the Louisville Orchestra, and the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. In 2016, Garrett began transi transitioning into the field of public media and content creation, where he does most of his work today. As a strong advocate for the diversification of classical music and the advancement of black musicians in the field, Garrett has used his platforms on local, national, and international airwaves to promote black artistry in classical music. So that is our panel. I am so pleased to have you all here. And what I'd like to do is turn first to conductor Brandon Keith Brown for a little bit of a foundational, to lay a little bit of a foundation for us about the state of racism in classical music as he sees it. And of course, bringing in, you know, racism as, a, as an American issue in general. Oh, Andy. thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for the um, introduction. By the way, your German is not much better than mine. So really don't worry about it. It's a very difficult language to pronounce. I wanted to um, thank you for letting me open this up. I wanted to read a small section of a piece I'm writing um, on uh, black moderation, black moderates, and uh, sort of talk about a little bit what we're going to be talking about today is a two minute opening. Um, so why are we here today? We're here today because white people won't stop killing us and stealing black lives. Black moderates also, they assist them by remaining complicit in our own oppression, censoring blacks who speak out against coveted whiteness. We need to decenter whiteness, but us as blacks, we've learned that every thought and every breath and every movement must consider whiteness. Our job is to keep you safe from, our own, from your own implicit bias that we're physically dangerous. We're dismissed as difficult before we speak and threatening and anxiety inducing, inducing before entering the room. If we step out of line, we lose opportunities, jobs and access to white networks. Move too fast in the presence of whiteness, we may lose our life like Armad Arbery shot while jogging. The fear of losing white relationships jobs, networks, and goodwill is real. In the words of Derek Bell in the book Faces at the Bottom of the Well, he said, you can have this job, promotion, house, membership, provided you subordinate your thinking and don't make waves on racial issues. Be acceptable and if possible, grateful. We measure inequality by its distance from whiteness. So even in our quest for racial equity, white supremacy is still the yardstick. Although we feverishly practice not making whites uncomfortable, classical music's Black Lives Matter movement requires we to center white feelings. In the words of Toni Morrison, she said, it's as though our lives have no meaning and no depth without the white gaze. Classical music favors blacks who are racist eunuchs. Blackness can't be escaped or ignored. But why do many blacks and many black moderates especially persist on muddling it 
with fear and insecurity. The fear and persecution of the white gaze. It requires, the white gaze requires that white feelings and white conscience is paramount, that blackness only exists in contrast to whiteness, not alone, that blacks have no quality until whites say so, blacks only speak favorably of whiteness and with permission, blacks, and it also requires that blacks discipline fellow blacks who deviate from the white gaze and disquiet the negative peace of racial harmony coveted by their own violent, selfish complicity in Uncle Tomism. It's the real fear of white reprisal that keeps black classical musicians dancing on the head of a pen to appease white people with our notes, only to still be given less than everyone else. Talking about anti-black racism should never consider the white gaze. Music requires us to bring all of ourselves on stage. We can only do this by disregarding the white gaze. To be a black classical musician, again, requires profound aloofness of blackness. Blacks who distance themselves from blackness are rewarded. Even blacks who achieve industry first feel condemned to publicly state they take no pride in doing so. We shuck and drive in a genre that doesn't want us lying to ourselves that if we go to this school, study with this teacher, play this passage clean enough, conduct this orchestra and find the perfect conducting gesture, we'll finally have approval from the white establishment. Unwittingly, we play into the ruse of meritocracy and deservingness, destroying our self-worth and thwarting possibility of genuine recognition and acceptance through sound. It's not enough to be seen. We must be heard. Thank you, Brandon. Um, now I'd like to um, reintroduce Nokatula uh, and see what you have to say. You and I had a little conversation the other day and you talked about um, the perceived threat of of black people towards white people. Um, I don't know if that's anything you feel like addressing now in the context of what Brandon just said, but feel free to say whatever you wish, of course. Oh, oh absolutely. First of all, I'm so happy um, to be here today uh, in all of your company. And thank you so much for asking me to be a part of this conversation. Uh, Brandon, that's some very powerful stuff. Um, when you were speaking and even in Dave's uh, introduction, we talk about the issues of racism, not just in classical music, but in society at large. And it reminded me, um, I do want to get back to some of the things that you said, but it reminded me of an experience I had growing up in Los Angeles um, when I auditioned for the Nikkei Foundation Scholarship. I'm half Japanese um, and born in the 70s. Um, and as I tell my children, I was lucky to have two mothers, my natural mother and my adoptive mother who basically raised me, who was a white woman. Um, I did have contact with my father as well. Um, and uh, my father used to give me a hard time about playing classical music, which was my love and my choice to play because my older brother played in Santa Monica Youth Symphony with Manuel Kempinski conducting and Ida Levin and Delana Jensen were in the section. And I just heard incredible musicianships. Dale Bridenthal was there as well. She ended up going into the LA Phil, one of the few black players in the LA Phil. Um, so I was around uh, some somewhat, some integration. I, I, I saw um, American Youth Symphony, my brother played under uh, Meili Mehta as well. And so I was around this society all the time and was welcomed um, and supported by the community. Um, when I felt that I wasn't supported was when I went to play this competition when I was 12 years old for the Nikkei Foundation. And I walked in and it was a panel of all Japanese people. And it was open to Issei, Nisei, Sansei, first, second, third generation Japanese Americans. I played, I played some Bach, I played some Smetna. 
and uh, they deliberated right in front of me. Uh, one of the gentlemen started screaming and yelling, was clearly agitated, and he got up and he walked out of the room. And then the rest of the jury turned to me and said, well, you've won. Like that. So, yes, there are issues of, um, you know, there, I guess there is that thread of maybe losing white relationships or um, making uh, the whiteness in classical music feel uncomfortable. But that was probably the most uncomfortable I felt. And then when I played the winner's concert to a room of Japanese people at the Beverly Hills Hotel uh, that came for the Nikkei Foundation, I walked out on that stage and it was one of the hardest feelings I've ever had to face because I definitely felt that I was the aberration, that I did not belong there. Um, and so, yes, it's an American problem, but it is a global problem. And I actually invite the conversations and I'm always so thankful to my family and to the community that raised me with that kind of opportunity. Um, I mean, that was completely the luck of the draw because it is not typical at all. And I understand that. Um, so... I, I just wanted to bring that up because I felt those kinds of pressures, but not necessarily from the places that you would think that they would come from. Um, I also want to um, talk about just the idea of being given less than other people in the field. Anybody who wants to become an artist it is an uphill battle. Doesn't matter where you're from or what you look like. This is an extremely mm -hmm. small and competitive field and people will use every product in their arsenal to get ahead. So yeah, sometimes that does mean that racism comes into certain booking decisions. Um, and I think that those incidences do need to be called out. Um, or employment decisions. And that's where we have to actively push forward and say, wait a second, why, why did this organization choose to do this instead of doing this? And then call it out and say, okay, maybe this organization needs to start thinking a little bit more openly about what, you know, the musicians that are here and, and, and not only what we want to cultivate on stage, but what we want to cultivate in our audiences. So I'm going to pass the ball to, to somebody else to pick up on that one. But th I think that's a good place to start. Um, I loved, by the way, uh, coming to Clarion concerts over the years. I have loved that both with Eugenia and also with Sanford um, and, and playing with great musicians and bringing music to audiences. And when Sanford uh, asked me to learn Tanya Leon's uh, tres voces trio that was that's been one of my professional highlights just learning her language and the fact that you guys pushed for that i think shows that you this organization has been thinking about this for a long time and continues to think about it continues to be engaged so thank you well thank you for that and before i ask garrett to speak i forgot to mention that our previous um a music director, uh, the violinist Sanford Allen, uh, sent me a nice note yesterday saying he's been unwell and hasn't been able to uh, get back to us because we invited him to be on the panel as well. Most of our uh, members of our, of our community, the Clarion Concerts community know Sanford Allen. For those of you who do not, Sanford Allen was our artistic director for about 20 years. He was the first, um, he's a violinist and was the first full-time a uh, black member of the New York Philharmonic. And he led our organization uh, and commissioned black compose, uh, composers, hired black uh, musicians and other uh, uh, musicians of color. And, and it was, it was um, something that I've been aware of. And as we've continued in the years since he left, um, we have commissioned, in fact, Nokatula, you're one of our current, uh, we've, we're commissioning you presently for work. Can't wait to hear it. Um, Me so too. We have, had, we have 
you know, I think we've done an okay job in terms of, um, you know, sort of diversity, let's say, in terms of programming and, and our approach. But I've learned from a few pre-conversations with the three of you that like every other organization in the business, there's still a lot more we have to learn. There's a lot more we have to do. And um, Garrett, I would love to hear what you have to say about this and, uh, and, and anything else. But in the meantime, uh, Sanford is watching this today and we send a thank you. You're with us in spirit and we really appreciate it and, and wish you all kinds of good health and happiness. Garrett. Yes, absolutely. First and foremost, thank you so much for um, inviting me. You know, I would be remiss if I didn't start by saying um, my shift into media um, and broadcast is what introduced me to the incredible recordings of Nokutula and uh, Eugenia. So um, it, it's an honor to be here um, in your presence. Uh, Brandon and I have collaborated many times and spent many, many hours on international phone calls. So it's great to be here uh, with Brandon as well. Um, and, and because I'm thinking of it, you know, in honor of Sanford, I would just like to say, um, growing up in Memphis, you know, you, uh, Dave, you mentioned the Eroica Ensemble, the, um, the uh, music director of that ensemble, and this was years ago, actually had Sanford in Memphis, and he performed at one of the uh, big um, historically black churches in, um, in Memphis, and w when I heard that he'll be performing, I, I went, so yeah, uh, th that, that's my experience hearing Sanford, and it's an experience that um, I'll, I'll never forget. Um, uh, there, are a lot, there are lots of things I kind of want to bounce off of, um, uh, and I'll start with something that Nokutula said, you know, just very quickly about and uh, being an artist, being an, an uphill battle. I, um, I came across a conversation uh, recorded between James Baldwin and Maya Angelou not too long ago, and they actually covered that exact thing. You know, I think uh, Maya Angelou um, talked about how um, you never actually succeed as an artist. There's no stopping ground. You're always going, and there's always somewhere to push. So I just wanted to make sure um, I underscored that. Before I uh, responded um, and uh, expounded on the really excellent excerpt uh, that Brandon read, I wanted to um, sort of contextualize my shift away from the stage um, into uh, broadcast media. <laughs> So as um, anyone uh, who has ever uh, practiced and gone out for an audition knows, winning an audition is very, very, very hard work. So when I won uh, the second bassoon position with the Knoxville Symphony Orchestra uh, back in uh, 2013, <clears throat> I felt like I had made it. I felt like I had reached that moment of success. But the longer I uh, was in the field and, and subbed with other orchestras um, everywhere, I was noticing that not only was I the only one in in the room and, and oftentimes in the building, um, my culture wasn't even uh, being engaged. I wasn't hearing music. I wasn't performing music that really spoke um, to my uh, experience um, as an artist, as a musician. Um, so, you know, with that in mind, I knew that I needed to be as visible as possible to make sure that people in the audience, that white folks in the audience knew that folks that look like me do this. And if there happen to be black folks or other folks of color in the audience, for them to see me and understand you can do this too. So that became my goal. In 2016, um, so and, and along the way, I'll add, you know, I had been doing consultation and public speaking on the side. Um, in 2016, an opportunity came for me to um, get a radio position and I had never been in radio but I knew being visible for me um, in classical music wasn't enough. I knew that I wanted my actual voice to come across and to impact and inspire as many people as possible. So, you know, it, it, it was a very difficult decision, you know, as tenure processes and orchestra show, giving up an orchestral seat is not something that musicians take lightly. I certainly did not take the decision lightly, but that was how dedicated I was and still am to making sure that classical music can be as equitable um, as a field um, as possible. Um, Brandon said uh, two things that I really wanted to um, underscore as well. First of all, on the subject of decentering whiteness, when we talk about decentering whiteness, we have to understand that so called classical music, classical music as we know it here in the United States and in the West, has always centered whiteness. That comes from the programming, that comes from the way um, we treat um, entry um, and maintenance of the concert hall. It goes into the 
uh, the, the way we think about funding, you know, really focusing on um, rich funders who, uh, them, who themselves have benefited from white supremacist structures here in the United States, um, that, that we can get into that more. But, you know, so when we, when we have the conversation of decentering whiteness, we have to really, really, really internalize and understand that whiteness has always been central in what we call classical music. So the step beyond that, in my opinion, is really um, contextualizing what the benefits and what the perceived risks are of decentering that whiteness. So I'm talking about programming. What if we made sure that most, not some, but most of the programming was music by women and composers of color? What, what would it really mean for us to um, not frame our fundraising goals around uh, rich white donors, but instead people like me or like anyone who can give 10, 50, maybe even $100 to fund an organization in that way. And then understanding um, that, you know, it's not up to black people or other people of color to engage the institutions. It's actually the other way around. But you have to make sure that it is attractive to people of color. Um, even with, you know, uh, my degrees in music and my experience on stage and, and, and here and there, you know, if, if I see a program or a season that does doesn't really um, look like my experience in classical music, I have no reason to engage that institution. How much more difficult will it be to engage someone who has no reason to have any interest in classical music? Uh, that's on decentering whiteness. On the um, And on the topic of the black moderate, I think that's something that really applies to this conversation when we talk about um, equity and classical music. Uh, we spend a lot of time, and when I say we, I mean the institutions at large, the orchestras, the conservatories, etc. We spend um, a lot of time um, celebrating black people and blackness by its ability to accommodate excellence as defined by whiteness. So what does that mean? As institutions, we aren't lauding the musician who can really play the Negro spiritual, who can really capture the essence of the music of Margaret Bond or Florence Price. We are measuring success by um, a student's or, or a professional's ability to, again, center whiteness in that art, to play that Bach, to play that Beethoven, to play that Schubert. That's how we've always measured excellence. So when we, so once you, so once you really understand that, you can understand that when we have people um, the, the one person in um, this, the one black person in this symphony, or the one black person that heads this institution, those people had to climb the ladders and do what they had to do under that white gaze and be um, be respectable in that way. So um, when we when we talk about turning the corner and really making classical music an equitable institution, we have to understand all of the systems that go into this present, the systems that have made this a, predom a predominantly white institution, the systems that have allowed certain black people to, um, to, to rise to the top, uh, rise to success, and how we can break that down and really make this an industry that that um, includes everyone, you know, um, and I'll, pa I'll pass the ball here, but um, just, you know, as an example of what's central to my work when it comes to decentering whiteness and understanding the black moderate and understanding, you know, how we must all um, shift in this field um, comes with the phrase classical music. When I give, um, when I give presentations, um, when I host my show and do other things, I often use the phrase so-called classical music again, because we have defined that phrase by a, a Western European aesthetic. Um, the tradition of classical music are global um, and far older than anyone named um, Bach or anyone else when you go into the traditions of uh, India, East Asia, and beyond. So uh, one of my goals for classical institutions is to really engage what that phrase really means. If we really take the phrase classical music and apply it to a much broader aesthetic of cultural music, music that is classic to an experience, I think the classical music institutions have a better chance of, of surviving and getting the attention of more people, a much broader audience than, um, than uh, the orchestras and the other institutions have served traditionally. Um, thank you. And before we move on, I just want to say um, that uh, 
who, for folks who are joining us uh, later, welcome to this panel, uh, this, a conversation with Black leaders in classical music. We are Clarion Concerts. You can find us at clarionconcerts.org. And this, uh, this panel, as well as all the concerts we do, take donations in order to make them possible. So if you go to clarionconcerts.org, you'll find that you can give us a little gift. As, uh, as Garrett said, we're pretty happy with 10 bucks, 20 bucks, 100 bucks, whatever you can share with us, uh, you make panels like this uh, possible. And on the note of expanding classical music, um, I'm a person of mixed heritage, of both European and Arab heritage. And I'm very proud to say that our next concert on, um, in, in our Clarion Concerts, it's coming up on December 5th uh, at 5 p.m., we are presenting um, music from the Iraqi Maqam tradition with Amir al-Safar and Hamid al-Sadi. Um, and we're really excited about that. It's the first time in our institution's history that we've gone outside the European tradition to present, um, as, as Garrett said, classical, classic music from, from another uh, great world tradition. So um, Brandon, I'd like, if you don't mind to follow up on what Garrett said, um, I think this idea of this of, of the centering of whiteness is really powerful. I, I had to, um, I came to this really late. I remember turning on uh, public radio, nothing against public radio. I've been a member since I was a kid. Um, and every once in a while it hits me that when I go on, I expect to hear white voices. It's just the, it's just the default. We just so expect it. And I think part of this conversation that is gonna be challenging to a lot of us is this is the first we've ever thought that, wait a minute, yeah, classical music as we define it, as we have defined it, is this Western European. And it's pretty limited to a few countries in Western Europe as well. We think of, um, we think of some of the Eastern European composers and the Armenian composers as being exotics. <laughs> so, so, um, so Brandon, you know, what might you have to say to further discussion to further discussion about whiteness and the centering of it? What I would like to do is I'd really like to hear from Nakatula um, about this. Did I say your name correctly? Oh, yes, you did. Okay. Yes. Um, I would like to hear from her about this. But before I pass it on to her, um, I would say classical music is probably the only genre where we immediately think that the that the performers and the consumers are white. Um, and, you know, that's a problem. Thank you. So let's pass it on to her. I'd like to hear what she has to say. Well, well, I agree. I mean, there's so much here to talk about. Uh, when, when Garrett was discussing um, kind of taking this, being more inclusive actually about the way we think about what so-called classical music is and looking back and seeing that music doesn't evolve in a racial bubble per se. Whatever is heard from popular, popular music, from people's travels through time goes in. And a lot of the time people might not even understand or know that, oh, wow. Uh, uh, I mean, we'll just take something totally out of the US context right now, the gamelan orchestras in Debussy, for example. Um, you know, it, it's when, musicians or artists or composers hear things that they want to follow up on in the abstract language of music, which is not dictating that someone has to look a certain way or think a certain way to hear it. The, people can let their minds run free. These limits that, that we're, we're talking about now don't need to exist. So the fact that they are existing and the fact that, um, that that it is segregating our audience is is a real problem. Um, I'll just talk about it in terms of my family yet again. My father did not support me learning the violin or the piano. He didn't understand it. He asked me, "Why are you playing this white man's music?" And I should say, as as you know, G Eugenia and I are the women on the panel today. I definitely grew up in that Ms. generation and being told more, oh, well, the women aren't in orchestras as much or, you know, the best that you could expect is maybe it'd be a principal violist somewhere. Um, it was much more of the, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, women being displaced in the field than people of color being displaced in the field per se for me. Um, 
I was also lucky to grow up around Althea Waits, who is a big Florence Price champion. And, um, and so I was around musicians who were in classical music, doing research about classical music, people of color in classical music, women in classical music, and recording these things and performing these things. So, um, so in that context, I think that we do have to celebrate the activists who've been around, who've brought us to this point and realize that the struggle is not over. Um, when I've gone to play in Zimbabwe for my family, half of them won't even come into the hall. Half of them won't even step foot onto the grounds of these of these uh, places because they're seen so much as a sanctified white space. And I get really frustrated at that point because I'm like, I'm playing. Can't you come to my concert? Like you are invited. I'm playing for you. Like, um, so, you know, there's a lot that has to be done to make classical or so-called classical music feel like a safe place for people of color and for women. Hey, you, said, you, you said something very, very powerful. You know, you talked about um, expecting to hear a white voice. Um, I definitely want to hear Brandon talk about the expectation of what people see in the concert hall, specifically when it comes to the conductor, because I think that is something that we don't really think about a lot. You know, the Met um, celebrated uh, earlier this year or last year when they had the all black uh, Porgy and Bess, but who was in the orchestra and who was on the podium? Was there a black person framing the musical perspective of this black centric piece of music? Or, or was that not the case? But, but, but before I, I pass the ball um, uh, to Brandon again, that expectation of seeing something white or hearing something right not only runs against the American tradition of classical music, it runs uh, uh, against the the general uh, canon, and it runs against the truth. And um, and you know examples that are coming to my mind, you cannot talk about um, Dvorak's Ninth Symphony or his so-called American quartet, which I think we should start calling the Negro <laughs> quartet. You, know, you can't talk about those pieces of music without talking about blackness or black people, even beyond the United States. I did a talk for the Minneapolis Public Library a couple days ago. You can't talk about the music of Darius Mio without talking about black people. You, there, there, there's so much within Frederick Delius. Delius. And, and, and on the subject of Delius, you can't talk about Delius without talking about slavery, specifically. So, you know, there, there are so many many connections there. So when we expect to hear something or see something white, um, not only is that not true and runs against the tradition of classical music, it actually shines a huge light on the conditioning that is a classical music education, teaching us to expect that whiteness, teaching us that this is a white man's or even a white woman's music, when the fact of the matter is, so much of it has connections to blackness. Everything that was composed and written in the United States and much of what was um, beyond. But I just wanted to make sure I made that point. But, you know, um, again, uh, speaking to the expectation of sight, even if we have a, a program full of black music in the concert hall, there seems to still be that expectation to see someone white on the podium. And I was wondering if Brandon could uh, go into that a little bit. I thought I thought we were going to get into that a little bit later. But, but I, I want to circle back to um, what she was saying about. I, I actually, she took the words from my mouth. The, the concert hall is a safe space um, for whiteness. It always has been. When we think about ourselves as human beings, there's some really basic things. I'm, I'm not a trained sociologist, but I study sociology. We wanna be around people that make ourselves feel comfortable. And it tends to be people most like ourselves. But then when we add the power dynamic of race, these spaces become white dominated spaces. So if we look at just sort of a really, really brief brief uh, Cliff's Notes version and uh, layman's version of African-American history. You know, 1865, we became uh, fully, supposedly in the constitution, fully human. Uh, we moved up from three fifths to five fifths human being. And then 1868, 1869, actually the, the 13th Amendment was ratified, we became citizens. But immediately that was all taken back in terms of 
the ability to vote for, for men and the poll taxing. We jump far, far ahead. Of course, we know about lynchings and everything else and redlining. And we jumped to 1964 and they discovered, oh, wait a minute, black people really didn't get any rights. We'll have a civil rights act now and we'll really make all things all better. But that didn't work I either. Meanwhile, in classical music, black musicians formed our own unions because we couldn't audition for the white orchestras, the well-established orchestras. We had to do our own thing. And it wasn't until the 70s, I think it was the mid 70s where black musicians began to be allowed to audition for, for orchestras. But at that time, you think about all of the inertia of marginalization. We still have today in 2020, we have first time graduates of college, um, black college graduates, because we haven't had the um, the, the, the legacy wealth, the educational legacy wealth, the, le the share legacy wealth and access to networks and educational legacy wealth, because the schools were segregated, we weren't allowed to go to schools um, for a very long time. And so you think about all of that opportunity um, that was lost of not being able to develop as string players, especially, it takes a long time um, and from a very young age to develop. Um, but now you see the level of strength playing is equal to the level of, of, of Asians who are a majority minority and also equal to the level of white people that are in classical music. It's equals the same. But still, we don't see people getting into the orchestras and getting tenured positions in the orchestra. We still we're not seeing an increase in number of people. And that has to do a lot with cultural repertoire. It's just all the information that we send out about who belongs and what is valued. And black people in the space of whiteness have different cultural repertoires. We value different things. We move differently. We speak differently. We think differently. We have um, a different um, mentality. And this isn't accepted by white people, whether it's, it's sometimes conscious, it's sometimes subconscious. It could be the type of hair that you have, the way you dress, the way you move. If you know black people, um, I would also say people from Latin America we move a lot more with our bodies when we play music to express ourselves. And whereas in classical music, um, in, in white classical music, white European music, you're taught to stand still and allow the music to efface the body. It's a wonderful book by sociologist Anna Bull, uh, Class Control in Classical Music. And she talks about um, uh, classical music transcending the body through stillness. But when you're asked to do gospel or something else, you're told to move because that's part of the um, genre. But anyway, going back to this idea of centering classical music, um, it's of centering whiteness and the concert hall being a safe space for whiteness. If white people can't sit next to us on the subway, they get up when, we sit, when I sit down, they cross the street when I'm walking down the street, when I have a mask on every corner I turn down the grocery store aisle, people are like, oh, you know, to see me as a black person in Germany with the, with the double mask on and my face shield on and that sort of thing. And I'm just trying to protect myself as an asthmatic. And, um, you know, especially also white women, I'm always, always terrified of white women at night um, because they have the fear of God in their eyes that I may rape them. They just look like this, just ter like terror, sheer terror in their eyes and they couldn't walk fast enough. And this makes my heart rate, you know, increase. It takes, and it takes years off my life. Um, we know that the allostatic load increases stress, stress related illnesses in the body and causes certain stress related illnesses um, in, in black bodies. And so, which takes years of our, of our lives. And so this need to maintain a white space has a real deleterious impact, not only on black classical music, but musicians, but this idea of every space being white. And, and this has a real deleterious impact on the lives of all black people. Um, so I just, I think that that's really important um, to bring. I wonder what it, what it is that white organizations can do to change this. Mm -hmm. And maybe, maybe um, Mrs. Zuckerman and Dave, you could think about what it is that white organizations can do to change this, to create a space that isn't. I, I um, very strongly affirm that repertoire and guest artist representation is a small piece of the puzzle. Um, education is a small piece of the puzzle. 
you, you, what are you going to do to get white people to want to or to become comfortable physically in their body? This is not a, you know, a cognitive issue. This is a physiological, sociological um, issue with the body bracing and having tension in the presence of blackness in, in the world. So, so coming into a room with a bunch of white people playing white music and all this sort of stuff, I hate going to classical concerts. I have written it, I have said it, you know, in one of my pieces, Black Concert Trauma, I hate going there. And it's my job to do it. Now, when I'm conducting, I don't see or anything outside of the sound and the eyes of the, my, my musicians. That's all I see. But the fact is I don't go to concerts because I feel so uncomfortable going there. I feel like an alien. I feel, so if I don't feel comfortable, who does feel comfortable going to these concerts? Before you, before uh, Eugenia and Dave answer, I just wanna anecdotally say, I went to a concert last night with the Miro Quartet. It was outdoors. Everybody was wearing masks. Everybody was sitting all these different, you know, sometimes 12 feet apart. Um, and I loved going to it. Um, I'm in Phoenix. There, uh, there's a very small black population in Phoenix. Um, I, and, and there isn't a lot of attendance for the Phoenix Chamber Music Society concerts. And that is something that I'm trying to work on as the composer in residence and also with their executive director uh, to, to make it, to make the space more inclusive. But I respect my colleagues so much and they played beautifully and I felt welcomed. I did, uh, but it's because of the actual friendships that I have with the performers and with the organization and being a part of the organization. So it makes me sad when I hear you say, Brandon, that you don't like to go to concerts because the, the, I believe that the concert hall is there for everybody. And it is up to all of us to make sure that everybody feels welcomed and that everybody feels like it can be is as much a part of their lives and a positive influence in their lives as, as it, it is for me. And it's and it's and it's 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 so important for institutions to understand and really, you know, uh, internalize it being their responsibility to make that space one where everyone feels comfortable, because uh, what Brandon is speaking to, you know, that um, the trauma of going into the concert hall as a black person, that is not as a black man, as, as a, a black, black man. Sure. That is. I, I, that, that does that make is, a difference. A man versus a woman, sure. the, 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 the perception of threat and uh, perception of aggression and the fear that gets um, churned up for people. It's, it's not only lived and experienced for folks who have gone in for black for black folks who have gone to the concert hall and experienced classical music it's perceived and understood by black communities on a broader sense it's the idea that going into those spaces period no matter what it, it would be for is something uncomfortable and foreign um, uh, Nokotula you uh, and, and Brandon you know we're, we're using this word safety safe spaces um, that word um, I live here here in the Twin Cities, for folks who don't know, you know, and uh, following the murder of George Floyd, you know, that word safe and safety really um, began to have a, a, a new feeling. A lot of people felt safety by the presence of um, the police department. Other people did not and responded accordingly. That's why the third precinct here in Minneapolis burned to the ground. How long before that perceived and understood whiteness of the concert hall, how long before that is is a threat to um, black communities. How long before 
we um, as as black communities feel like the concert halls need to burn down in the same way that those police stations yeah. did. Doing this work is 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 the right thing to do, certainly, but it will also benefit the institutions down the road. There are so many industries that have thrived during this COVID era. You know, we talk about Zoom and, and delivery things and, and other things. Classical music is not one of those industries that has thrived this year because because it spent so long putting all of its energy and attention on such a small percentage of the populace. When you spend so much time serving a few people, when something traumatic um, as COVID comes, you can serve no people. As, <laughs> as orchestras are doing. So, right. so, you know, I really want to make sure people understand that point. It's not only about us saying you need to do better because you need to do better. Doing better as classical institutions will benefit the institutions and Absolutely. ultimately the art form that we all love. Yeah, I, yeah, and to, okay, so Dave, uh, finally, Dave and, <laughs> Dave and Mrs. Zuckerman, do you have and something I, to say? I've already said a little bit, so let's turn it over to you, Eugenia, if there's anything you'd like to say or ask. I would like to say that I have a different experience, maybe because I'm white, um, and maybe because I grew up as a musician in New York City with uh, wonderful teachers and I never had the sense of being afraid to be who I was. Um, I felt that as a, as a musician, I could really grow in many ways. I also think that I was so lucky to have uh, teachers. And uh, I'm thinking in particular of um, young concert artists. I was one of the youngest young concert artists and it was a place where I was really encouraged to be who I wanted to become as a musician. And um, we did have, uh, I, I, I do remember that we had a number of students who were not the same color as me, but it, that was a time when um, I think it just felt safer. And I, uh, particularly with young concert artists, Susan Wadsworth is just remarkable for what she has done. Yes, she is. By just, uh, and, and everyone should say hats off to this woman because she made it possible for musicians who didn't know they were musicians to thrive. And one of the things that I'm reminded of is that uh, Susan would get a group of uh, the young artists and bring them to a table and talk to them about what do you think of this person's playing? Does, does that person want to play for you? It was, a, it was somehow a way to um, be a group together, but also to test ourselves. Um, Susan, ex expectations were always very high. And um, if you look at the incredible number of musicians who were with Susan Wadsworth, um, most of them are superstars. Uh, and it was because she took the effort to uh, understand each, each person as, as, as she did. And I feel very grateful to that. And I think that um, a lot of people feel grateful to really good teaching. I know you know Katula um, from way, way back. And I know that you grew so quickly through the teachers that you had. And um, I, I am very grateful for the help mm -hmm. I had as a musician. And I would think that there are uh, others too who really learned from that and I think from learning from it I, I think and I hope that when I have been teaching or whether I've been playing with those others I have learned how to be a person at the same time that I am a musician. That was so thank you for that I, I wish that we could have a whole session on on teachers because I think we've all had amazing teachers that have touched our lives I certainly have I had um, the Vemoses were my teachers, um, Roland and Amita Vemos, and uh, they're like my grandparents. And um, it, you know, I, you know, being in their studio, I mean, there was never, 
I, in my personal life, I didn't have this rude awakening, if you will, or become woke until I had a really horrible experience at Brown University where I was told that because I was hired, hired because I was black and the students before they met me, you know, said, said I was threatening and anxiety inducing and, and all of this. And I was physically assaulted by a student and fired very publicly. And I didn't understand what happened. And then in the aftermath of that is me coming to sociology and me, you know, coming to understand institutionalized racism and, and that this happens quite often to people, not so publicly, but this happens quite often. But I want to talk about that. But the, the teaching aspect, um, gosh, I, couldn't, I can't get started on my, uh, shouldn't get started on my love for, teach, for my teachers that I've had. I've been extraordinarily lucky. Um, but going to the, to the playing, the, the issue of meritocracy, of the quality of playing, that's something that maybe I could help switch the conversation to. So meritocracy doesn't exist in classical music because only white people decide by default. So that's something that we can't argue with. So what happens is if we say that we have meritocracy, we, we talking about the objectification of playing. So we're talking about intonation, rhythm and articulation primarily, things that are not, should not be so negotiable um, in an orchestral audition. Um, we're talking about these things and, but the fact is that white ears are the ones of judging. And so what we're doing is say white ears are supreme and that white ears are the only ones capable. When we talk about go into the mm -hmm. issue, I don't wanna to go too much into this. I think Garrett is more qualified maybe to go into this. I haven't written a piece on it yet. When we talk about the orchestral screen, for instance, when we talk about um, going to an orchestra audition, a lot of people are advantaged by having the white teacher and being white and having been in the white youth orchestra and having had the, vi the violin lessons from age three or four or five, which is normally where you have to start to have a fighting chance at this darn thing. And they, these people have been subbing in the orchestra. They skip the first two rounds. They come to the final round where the curtain comes down and you've got the black person in the final round too, who's unknown perhaps because they haven't been in the white network and the white system, but they fought their way through on merit. And all of a sudden, people start listening with their eyes. And if you want to say people don't listen with their eyes, you have to say that colorblind racism doesn't exist. You have to say that um, people, that, every, that regardless of the color of people's skin, everybody has an equitable chance. Everybody doesn't need, you don't need to help women a little bit more than men. You don't need to help uh, black people a little bit more. You don't need to, to balance it you have to agree to, to colorblind racism. You have to agree to being racist if you don't believe people listen with their eyes. So this is where we see people being deleted, which is in that final round. Now to go back to what Garrett said about the presence of blackness on the podium and being a black conductor, there's a lot of implicit bias that comes with being a black conductor on the podium. First of all, we're an anomaly physically, we very, look very far removed from the European tradition. And I'm responsible for getting a lot of people to, to have a consensus for a given week on a piece of music. It's not all of what I want. What I want is to have a little bit of, I want to lead every person in their own performance. And so I have to get them to be the best that they possibly can be, but I have to get their goodwill because again, I make no sound. I have no effect on them at all unless they decide to give me their goodwill. Um, so that's something I have to earn. But it starts from a deficit because they haven't had a black conductor. They haven't had a black teacher. And they believe in meritocracy like everyone else. They believe that the cream, the cream always rises to the top. And if you are not in front of them, you must have not been good enough. And musicians, the fact is musicians can spend their whole entire lives playing in an orchestra and never have a black conductor and never feel any sense of loss about it and never have any sense of loss. Well, what did we miss not having a black conductor? And I believe that making music through the rungs of oppression gives you more to sing, more to play about, more to conduct about than anything else. You know, if we look at some of the greatest musicians who are Jewish, it's not an, it's not an accident that some of the greatest musicians are, are Jewish. You know, when you had to go undergo, you know, the history of being some of the world's most hated people, most persecuted, most oppressed people, 
And now you're able to mix some of the most deepest excavations of human communication. Yes, that makes sense. And it also makes sense that Blacks created the greatest exportation of American culture. If we were given access to classical music in the same way, we also dominate it, just like you know Beyonce dominates pop music. It wouldn't be different. And that's a fear that white people have is that we will invade these white spaces. But being on the podium, what will create equity in orchestra land in classical music is when you have black music directors of top orchestras. And I'm not saying this just to be self-serving because of course that's, you know, it's, who wouldn't want to be of a top you know, conductor of a top orchestra. But with this is granting central cultural membership. What we want, all of us musicians, uh, uh, you know, black musicians here, we want cultural membership. We want to we want to say, I play well enough. Let me in, and that's what we want. And I, I, if I'm wrong, please correct me after I finish speaking. But but I think that what we want is cultural membership. Having a black conductor on the podium will understand the cultural repertoire of black musicians who get in the orchestra and help tenure these musicians, not out of favoritism. I'll give you an example. This is an, an international example. I won't name names, but it's happened in many orchestras. Um, a lady has an Afro and she sits principal second violin or principal so something. And people say, we can't see the conductor very well, cut your hair. Okay, in some states in America, that's against the law now. But in orchestra land, this is something that a, a non tenor this is a, a, a non tenorable offense, okay? Um, if you're a wind player, there's not a lot of room sometimes in those woodwind sections or, or, or it's very close quarters, especially if you play the flute. And if you're a person that likes to move their body a lot and you've been taught this to move your body is just because of your human nature, stop, hey, stop moving so much, young man. You move too much. Um, you wear dreadlocks or something like that. Garrett can talk maybe from experience. You wear, you wear a certain type of hair. It's too loud. Management says, excuse me, um, this, is, this is not, you know, this is the type of altering of self that white people do not have to do to survive in classical music. And so I've, I've bridged this conversation from meritocracy doesn't exist People who decide who's deserving of a career are always white by default. And that also means that deservingness is racist. I've written an article on deservingness is racist. And I also said the answer to solving a lot of these problems of, of, of inequality and inequity in the numbers of black musicians in orchestras is to hire more black conductors is to hire black conductors that understand the cultural repertoire. White conductors have failed to understand the cultural repertoire and narrative. Cultural narrative is the history of black people and narrative of black people. This is why we have this inequality because they're not able to understand and or empathize with our experience. But it's the same with all fields, but in orchestras, this is particularly uh, what I'm speaking on today. Okay, I, I thank you for that. And just a reminder, folks, uh, this is Clarion Concerts. We're speaking with black leaders in classical music, talk, uh, tackling the very difficult um, problem of race and racism in our field and in the world. Um, earlier, Brandon, you asked Eugenia and me, what do you think we can do ourselves. We're a small regional organization, but I know I'm speaking on behalf of many of the other presenting organizations in our region that have been invited to this today and are attending. Um, what's been a real head scratcher for many of us is our audiences are largely older, they're definitely white, they're, they're aging, they're shrinking. And I think in the back of my mind, I've known that in my own mind, there's something missing in our approach because it's been hard to expand our listenership um, age-wise, diversity-wise, um, and we had a couple of, uh, for, the, for the people who are, who are attending this, uh, who are audience members, we had a couple of discussions before this happened, and in fact, in one of our discussions, um, I believe it was Garrett who talked about uh, community involvement, and 
I was, I'm ashamed to say it, surprised by your suggestions, which had nothing to do with music, had nothing to do with art, but actually had much more to do with um, community involvement in the community around us. And I know in our region, uh, we have a large and a historic uh, black community. Uh, our region is home to, was home to Sojourner Truth. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois is from Great Barrington. Um, Elizabeth Freeman, who, who's, whose court case ended up um, ending slavery in the North, came from Klaverak here in Columbia County, and she finished uh, her life in um, Sheffield, Massachusetts. So we have a, 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 a Black community here that, as far as I'm concerned, we've not been successful at all in reaching. Uh, we have a growing Latinx, uh, Latinx uh, community that I have nowhere to get in touch. Uh, no, I don't know how to get in touch with them. And, and thirdly, um, we have a large working class white community, uh, a background that I share. And um, I learned about classical music in school. My mom played piano. She came from a, a fairly educated family that had music in the home from Arab classical music to opera, to Broadway, to classical. So we had that coming in, but we really got our training from well, what at that time we were well-funded public schools. Um, and one thing that you suggested to us was, you know, don't just sort of beg for audiences and to come here and say, we have something that's really good for you. You must want to be here. You've discussed earlier, you know, the, our, our halls and our concert halls and our spaces are not very welcoming uh, to the audiences that we're not getting and are hoping to get. So um, Garrett, as I said, I, according to my memory, it was you who talked about some of the community engagement that other organizations have done and that may be possible for us. And that really intrigued me because um, while I feel like it's great for us to put on concerts, it would be really great if we could also involve ourselves in community issues, go find spots in, in the community in our area where we can be of help, where we can co-sponsor events, where we can volunteer. And so could you talk about that a little bit, that ways that smaller organizations like ours can get started in, in starting to change our mindset and to open our doors uh, to the full experience of not only what we have to give, but we, what, 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 we, what we can gain from from uh, new audiences. Absolutely. Uh, uh, quickly, before I uh, uh, speak to that, you know, just to give, again, the people um, an example of, you know, sort of what my goals are um, in the work that I do as far as inspiring people to understand the depths of white supremacy in classical music. When we talk about things like tuning, intonation as objective, that that our definition of what is in tune is even based on that white gaze, you know, the tradition of Western um, uh, classical music. So, you know, even in the in the way we think about things like intonation, we have to really critique the uh, tradition, you know, uh, cr critique our conditioning, you know, to make sure that we're being as equitable as possible. You know, um, so when, when it comes to, um, you know, what you're speaking to community engagement, from my perspective, a lot of uh, organizations, classical organizations have confused audience development with community engagement. So audience, I think of audience devel development as transactional. We have something that we can offer you and in return, you will offer us something, usually a ticket sale or, or something along those lines. When we talk about community engagement, we're talking about an institution engaging a community without the expectation of some sort of um, transaction. I think the um, examples that I uh, may have brought up, you know, uh, it's the holidays next week. I can talk, uh, you know, for a long time about um, uh, destroying the idea of Thanksgiving as a holiday. But for the sake of this conversation, I'll say Thanksgiving, so-called Thanksgiving is next week. Why isn't every orchestra in the country giving out turkeys to their community? Why isn't every tenure uh, member of a uh, of an orchestra um, out putting their mask on and making sure that um, uh, folks uh, who use homeless shelters are fed? You know, we, we often think that um, as musicians, we're limited to what we can do with our instruments in our hand or with a baton in our hand, but it's so much broader than that. You know, the trajectory of my career, I think is a testament. I'm trained in bassoon. Um, I work in content creation 
education in media now. I don't have a degree in uh, digital engineering, but you know, I put forward the work on my own to make sure that I could do um, the equitable work that I felt like needed to happen in classical music. So when we talk about you know what small organizations can do, I actually think smaller organizations are perfectly fitted to um, to 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 turn the corner because as we've seen with the Met and the New York Philharmonic, two of the largest institutions, they aren't agile enough to survive right now. So they're dark. They're not serving anyone. So when it comes to those smaller institutions, I would really encourage folks in leadership to consider the idea of what it looks like for your institution to serve the community in a way that they can actually use. And that might not necessarily be music. What does it look like to give, if you want to stick with uh, music, what does it look like to give free music lessons? What does it look like for the uh, members of that institution to listen to the musicians of the community, bring in the local rapper, bring in the local um, uh, jazz artist, wherever, not to um, feature them so that you can get ticket sales, but so that you as an institution can understand some of the other musical aesthetics that are happening in your community. Maybe understanding that will be a great way for um, institutions to engage that community. Before I give up the mic, you know, when we talk about um, the difference between community engagement and audience development, um, I always uh, think it's worth it just to lay out just in case, you know, uh, the differences between equality and equity. We're using that word equity a lot. When we're when we talk about equality, we're talking, and this is just a quick definition uh, from my perspective. When we talk about equality, we're talking about a level playing field. When we talk about equity, we're talking about doing what we need to do to make the playing field equal. So what does equity look like in that case? It looks like intentionally hiring black people, not only to push papers or be the doorman, but to be on the podium and to be in leadership positions within the organization. And it looks like putting forward the effort of, of um, engaging the community, maybe not in a musical way. See what resources your organization has to do something for someone in your community, even if it does not involve playing any music. Blacks, at, at Blacks as the lowest common denominator must be responsible for the artistic product the artistic product. So, so that's how you're gonna get cultural membership. And to go back on what Garrett was saying, we, we agree, I agree basically with everything Garrett says. Even the, even the mistakes I make, it's better to listen to him <laughs> than me in many ways. Um, but what, but what, to take a step further is if I were a music director of a, of a city, um, a city that is 66.7% black, a city that is 49% black, we all know what the cities are because I've already written about them. Um, I would think about making a free healthcare center of, of getting money. If I were an orchestra suffering from not having enough money, that means that I'm not relevant. If 66.7% of your city is black and nobody in your audience is black and your orchestra's got one black person or they're not really, they're, they're, maybe you don't have any black people, no black people on the staff at all. And the music director of course isn't black. I would think about addressing the needs of that community, making a free healthcare center, making a, a, some sort of program for ex-felons who can, so that they can get a job and be employed, having a forum between the police, between the police and the citizens of the community to, ex to express their, 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 their needs and to try to stave, um, stave away police brutality. It's a major issue. You know, I've had guns put to my head. You would think, oh, you're not, you know, like a, you know, this, like who, there, well, actually there's no stereotype of a black man that you could say that have guns put to their head. You know, everybody has been stopped, you know, ev of every economic level, of every sort of educational level. So you can't stereotype. We've all been victims of some type of police. Most of us, if you've driven a car, um, you definitely have been pulled over for no reason. So these are the issues that orchestras should be addressing, the needs of the Black community, not the needs of the orchestra, not outreach, not, I would say, even Garrett, I actually don't care about you teaching little kids the, the music lessons. Now, I know that's weird. I want you to teach them. But a lot of kids don't know that that's something to be valued because they don't have music in the schools. I, I was in Chicago, a lot of different areas. I worked in public schools in different capacities as a musician and as not as a non-musician. And in majority um, lower income neighborhoods, there's no there's no music teacher. You know, they're, so they, they don't have any. There's no library also, but they have no 
idea what the world of music could be and could look like. And, and so they're not, no, they don't know what they're missing. And, um, and I got started with my fourth grade music teacher and, and Mrs. Zuckerman talked about the impact of music teachers on, on lives. We could do a whole session, which I'd love to on that. However, these kids don't know, but what they do know is that the, they don't have any electricity at their house. And I, I, I know that there was a, a school that I worked at and there was a family of five that died in the middle of a Chicago summer because they had a house full of candles and no electricity. So they, and they all burned up. So that's the needs of the community, not lessons and not free tickets and, and not anything. And so if we can address these social needs, then when the orchestra has a strike and says, oh my God, we need your help. There was, I'm gonna tell a story and then I'm gonna let, let it go and I'll be, be quiet. There's a major orchestra that was having a strike and over 30% of the city is black. And the, the council for this orchestra said, hey, why don't you do something to um, approach the, the black and brown community because they could really support you. They could really help you. They fired him. Well, they weren't interested. Yeah. So, so. It, I know it's. it's, it's Those are some decisions that aren't necessarily being made, taking into account, I would say, the longer vision of, of how arts can transform our society and bring us closer together. I do have to say, Brandon, that I disagree with you about the importance of education and exposure. I think that that is our number one task. I mean, yes, uh, wouldn't it be great if uh, a major symphony or orchestra could say, yeah, we sponsored uh, 1,000 turkeys for this community. I mean, so that the kids could say, oh yeah, well, we went, you know, this is from such and such organization. Sure. I mean, maybe in the future that would make them feel more welcome to, to partake in that, in, in the organization's artistic offerings. But if we don't go out and share these gifts that, 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 that we have to share that have been cultivated by teachers who went out and shared those gifts with us, then we definitely are hurting the next generation and hurting basically all arts organizations. We have to prioritize education and exposure. Yes, we have to also be there for the community. And yes, we have to make these per the performance spaces, the orchestras, the administration, much more diverse. And that has to open up because as we know, even from corporate America, the more diverse these companies are that are there just to make money, actually the better they do. So yeah. if, if arts organizations actually want to do better, they have to diversify. I mean, we already have the data showing that. So it's now just getting over the mentality. I think it's a very interesting point to um, talk about um, what on um, what tier is that uh, education um, uh, piece of it. Maybe I'll be a bit of the middle person here. You know, I'm so moved uh, by uh, Brandon um, talking about, you know, health care out of these organizations. So and I'll and I won't spend long to say this, but, you know, uh, my dad is a scientist. He's always worked. Um, in um, with blood and and if, and I'm I'm not a scientist so I don't have the vocabulary to talk about what he does but at the beginning of COVID his whole um, team his his whole department switched into um, uh, COVID research and 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 testing what how different would the situation be here in the United States if every single one of these orchestras who cannot be on stage right now became testing centers? What would, what would it look like? Th there's a possibility for there to have been thousands of people whose lives were saved. So 
you know, I, I will agree with Brandon that for me, uh, the education aspect is not top priority. I think if orchestras can understand how to engage their communities on those levels, if the if the orchestra of a community has um, played a role in the saving of lives, the people in that community can understand how the other things that that institution has to offer can also enrich them. So maybe I'll, I'm, I'm sort of taking middle ground there. I, I definitely affirm the importance of, of education. You know, I wouldn't be here on this panel if someone hadn't, you you know, shown me so-called classical music uh, once upon a time. With that being said, we can't um, we can't allege that classical music is objectively um, uh, good for a person's life. Um, healthcare and food are things that are objectively good for a person's life. So I think there is there's certainly a middle ground there to reach when it comes to you know what institutions can um, do um, uh, for a community. I think um, the the <laughs> bigger picture, uh, the the point I would like to try to make even bigger here is that many institutions. Um, consider black communities monoliths. There are different needs within communities. There are different um, um, uh, wants within communities, different perspectives. And that's why the idea of community engagement is so important. It's not just about serving um, the royal we version of black people. It's about serving the black folks in your community that can help you make your uh, institution more equitable and more relevant. I think that um... Uh, education is extremely important, but it's not enough to bridge the gap between uh, the social and spatial distancing that orchestras create between themselves and Black communities, um, in inner city Black communities. The orchestra members of most, many orchestras, they live in the suburbs, which are richer, nicer homes, more space. Um, they live in the suburbs, they don't live in the city, they have a physical disconnection um, from it. And if we, education alone isn't enough. And also, I, I've, of course, I, I'm a big component of education, I, I speak a lot on it, but when we're talking about this issue, the orchestras are basically in, they're on life support. A lot of these organizations are on life support. Um, it's not about what the community can do for them. It's not about what you can do for us. It's about what we can do for you. What can orchestras, what can classical musicians in classical music do for the people? And, and forcing them with a spoon, this is why I think ra outreach is racist and I'm completely against outreach. The American form of outreach, they're doing some interesting things in Scotland uh, and also in Britain with outreach where they go into communities and they play the music from that community and from that village. And they do some really interesting pedagogy. That does happen in some places in America with El Sistema and happens in some, but more often than not, especially with the big orchestras um, and some of the orchestras that I've conducted for educational concerts, it's dump and pour. It's take, oh, Mozart, Beethoven, they dump it, hey, they, we do a concert once a year and then we leave. Um, and that's not outreach. And these are programs established by, so the, the education, of course, is extremely important, but it just isn't enough. It just isn't enough to justify the existence of the orchestra. And I honestly will tell you, you know, live that many orchestras do not deserve to exist. There's no reason for them to exist <clears throat> in their communities. They suck so much money from a very small group of white people in 2016, 2% of Americans went to the opera, but yet you have the Met, it has a $144 million annual budget. I don't know, I'm not sure if fiscally that that's a responsible way of using $144 million for a very small group of people in the New York area or, or on the Eastern, Eastern seaboard um, to come and to see some operas every week. And, and, and I also want to point out, if this is the last thing I say, everything that I talk about is in service to the music. We're damaging and hurting the music. Racism and white supremacy is damaging and hurting the music. That's, we, this will out, music will outlive all of us. We're a bunch of little ants on a timeline. And all of these things that we're doing to ourselves to separate ourselves within the concert hall and within society and all of this sort of BS, this is hurting 
the stuff that we're trying to uphold and put in place into the future. And I know Garrett has some qualms about me saying this, but I'm gonna say it anyway. I wanna put these composers and these works, contemporary, modern, whatever, whoever it is, I wanna put them safely into the future for future generations. But if people aren't gonna hear it, what's the point? Right, well, listen, um... I hate to wrap this up. I could list, I could feel like we can go on for quite a long time. And I want to thank um, all of our guests. And I neglected to introduce the name you see on the square here. Oswaldo Rosette has very kindly helped us out with the technical end of things. And Oswaldo, we thank you very much. Um, uh, I thank all of you panelists. You have really given us a very clear picture of what the problem is. Uh, you've given us background. And I think most usefully to many of the presenters in our area who are paying attention to this, some ideas about how we might better engage with our communities. Um, I know I've gone from feeling slight despair about our connection to our community to feeling actually quite a bit uh, inspired now by, by the suggestions you all have made. And um, I admit it didn't occur to me to do something non-musical. Uh, so um, I thank you for that alone. That alone may help my organization and, and the people in our area. Um, so if it's okay to wrap up, if you all feel like you've, does anybody want to say a final word or are we good? I want to thank, uh, first of all, um, Eugenie Zuckerman, our artistic director, who uh, when I suggested this panel to her was 100% behind it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I first uh, learned about Garrett uh, and called him, uh, emailed him right away. And then I heard Brandon on Here and Now on, on NPR and called him right away. And Nokatula stepped right up. So we're really grateful for the three of you uh, for helping us out in, in this. We, I, speaking for, as for the Clarion Concerts Board, I would like to say we want to be part of the solution. And um, you guys have really, really helped our community a lot. So I thank Eugenia, I thank Garrett McQueen, I thank Brandon Keith Brown, and I thank Nokatula Nguanyama. Uh, you've been just so great. And once again, we're clarionconcerts.org. If you enjoyed this um, panel and you thought it was useful, please consider going to our website, clarionconcerts.org and making a donation. Uh, this has been a very tough time for all organizations. Um, in terms of fundraising and keeping our, our, our work going. So if, if you have something to spare and you'd like to give us a little gift, we'd greatly appreciate that. And also join our mailing list while you're there so we can properly thank you. And um, once again, this uh, is being recorded, so it will be available on our website after this. And um, this has been you know, a great honor for me to, um, to host uh, you all. And I just, I thank each and every one of you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It's been great talking to all of you and a lot of food for thought. Absolutely. And I could use some uh, food now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. Look, if I can leave people with um, anything, you know, these conversations aren't easy for a lot of people, but uh, as, as I said earlier, if we're going to make a world the, uh, a better place, every institution, every part of that world really needs to dive in and interrogate its traditions and understand how it can serve a more equitable world. As it as it is now, classical music as an institution is not a part of the equitable world that we want to be. We're here to change that. I think it's possible, but it's going to take all of us doing what we can and really engaging these conversations in an honest way. It's difficult for black people to have this conversation as well. There's an enormous opportunity cost that we have. Um, we lose opportunities because uh, white people who have a lot of power and influence immediately will turn off to this and turns us off and are not gonna hire um, me or, or any of us perhaps because we said something that you know, was upsetting to them. So there's an enormous amount of bravery that's in the room. Um, I honor that. Um, it's, it's something that I uh, try to have. Uh, with me every day, but um, I'm so honored um, to have learned from, from everyone here, um, but especially Nokotula and, and Garrett um, um, today. Um, yeah, I'm just very honored to be among you. It's, it's always a learning ex experience. Nobody has all the answers. 
Um, my mind is certainly always open. Um, what we do as musicians is really great. And um, if we want to keep doing it, we have to talk about these things. Great. Well, thank you very much, everybody. And that ends our panel. Thank you very much. Enjoy the holidays and be safe and be well, everyone. Good luck to you all. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Say goodbye.